Um, I'd like to thank you for joining us today for our training on the clinical challenges for the management of pregnancy and delivery in women, girls, and people with the propensity to menstruate. These trainings are provided by um, the cooperative agreement NHF has with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. It is noted that the contents are solely the responsibility of the authors and do not necessarily represent the views of the CDC. This program is part of a series of accredited provider education jointly provided by the University of Nebraska Medical Center and NHF. This program will provide interactive conversations about the challenges that healthcare providers face when managing the potential complications that can develop during pregnancy and delivery for WGPPMs with a family history or symptoms of a bleeding disorder. My name is Marcy Hardy. I'm the moderator and a manager of medical education grants at the National Hemophilia Foundation. Today, we are joined by Dr. Andrew Jean, who is an OBGYN consultant with a specialty in maternal fetus and in high-risk obstetrics. We are also joined by Dr. Paridi, Peter Kowidis, who is a hematologist in New York and serves as the medical and research director at the Mary M. Gooley Hemophilia Center. Our format for today, after this brief introduction, Dr. James will deliver a presentation followed by Dr. Kowidis. Um, this part of the program will be recorded. At the end of their presentations, the recording will stop and we will move into breakout rooms with Dr. Kweedis in room, one room and Dr. James in the other sharing a case study and providing an opportunity for collaborative discussion between each of the physicians and you, the attendees. There again, the recordings will be stopped for that period of time. Then everyone will come back to the full group room. Recording will be resumed again and Dr. James and Dr. Kweedis will summarize the discussion that happened in that room. After this session, eventually these this program will be uploaded to NHF's websites for that additional people can view at a later time. The learning objectives were sent out to you on some paperwork before the program and are available online. For the sake of time, I'm not gonna read them to you, but um, you can find them in your inbox if you're looking. For the program to go to su successfully today, we ask that you please add questions to the chat. And then it's important for you to lend your voice to the case study discussion in the breakout rooms. Again, the recording will be stopped at that time. We encourage you to turn your cameras on when you're in that breakout room as it helps foster open communication. With that said, I turn this over to Dr. James to begin. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, as Marcy said, I am an obstetrician gynecologist and uh, specialist maternal fetal medicine. So that will be my perspective. These are my disclosures. Nothing is relevant to the content of this presentation. Uh, my portion will be to discuss the prevalence of underlying bleeding disorders that affect pregnant women, talk about the mechanisms of life-threatening bleeding at the time of delivery, recognize the maternal implications of an underlying bleeding disorder, recognize the fetal and neonatal implications of an underlying bleeding disorder, and describe the obstetrical options of severe postpartum hemorrhage. So I want to talk about maternal bleeding first and put it in perspective. First of all, pregnancy is a hypercoagulable state, meaning women are actually less likely to bleed when they are pregnant. They have evolved so that they're prepared to face the bleeding challenges of miscarriage and childbirth. Dr. James, I'm going to interrupt you real quickly. Sorry, we can't see your slides. Oh, good grief. Sorry. <laughs> uh, why don't uh, well, we had that taken care of? I'm sorry. Uh, I'll try sharing my screen once, and then I'll just ask you to uh, advance the slides for me. Okay. Can you see the slides now? Yes, we can. Um, it's not in shared mode yet, um, but we can see your deck. How about that? Um, it's still side by side view. It's thinking. <laughs> Thank you everyone for your patience. Technology always throws a curveball. I'm going to have you advance the slides. We have limited time. So, uh, can you bring? Okay. I'll bring up the deck. Thank you. Um, Sorry about that. 
Here you go. So uh, importantly, women with a healthy placenta do not bleed during pregnancy. Uh, and women with a bleeding disorder are less likely to have systemic bleeding when they are pregnant compared to when they are not because of this hypercoagulable state. Nonetheless, as compared to other women, women with a bleeding disorder are more likely to bleed at the time of delivery than other women. They are not, however, more likely to have a massive life-threatening hemorrhage. Massive life-threatening hemorrhage with coagulopathy almost always evolves from obstetrical or surgical bleeding at the time of delivery. Next slide. And then transitioning to fetal or neonatal bleeding. Fetal or neonatal bleeding is very unlikely in an infant with a mild or moderate bleeding disorder. Uh, infants with severe bleeding disorders though can have life or brain threatening bleeding, uh, i.e. intracranial hemorrhage. And because hemophilia factor eight and factor nine deficiency is X-linked, an abnormal gene on a single X chromosome can result in a severely affected male infant. And other severe bleeding disorders are almost exclusively autosomal recessive, meaning they require two abnormal genes, are extremely rare and rarely anticipated. Next slide. So uh, the estimated prevalence of inherited bleeding disorders among women in the United States based on uh, population studies is about, of, on Willebrand disease, for instance, is about one in a hundred based on hospital discharge data, uh, the estimated prevalence is about one in 4,000 based on uh, number of deliveries. Uh, based on patients enrolled in treatment centers, the prevalence is about one in 10,000. Uh, for hemophilia carriership, uh, the estimate is about one in 2,000 to one in 5,000, and for rare bleeding disorders, one in a million. Next slide. Uh, these are data from the surveillance of females registered in US hemophilia treatment centers uh, between 2012 and 2021, it was published by the CDC. 62% had von Willebrand disease, 7% were carriers of hemophilia, 11% had various other clotting factor deficiencies, 19% had platelet disorders, and 2% had connective tissue disorders or disorders of fibrinolysis. Next slide. Now I mentioned that pregnancy was a hypercoagulable state and uh, since uh, von Willebrand factor and hemophilia carriership are the most common conditions we encounter, uh, it's important to look at how those factors change during pregnancy and there is an increase in factor eight. Uh, there's an increase in von Willebrand factor, but there is not an increase in factor nine. And that has implications for how we manage our pregnancies. Next slide. I'll talk about von Willebrand disease first. These are data from Jill Johnson's lab. And you can see here, uh, looking at trimester of pregnancy, how von Willebrand factor, specifically von Willebrand factor antigen, rises very uh, significantly during pregnancy. Factor eight increases not as dramatically. Uh, and then there is a rapid drop off after delivery. Next slide. Dr. Quides uh, and I, along with some of our colleagues, studied von Willebrand factor and factor eight levels postpartum. In the goal, uh, the, the x-axis there, you see the number of days postpartum. Uh, the y-axis there demarcates the time of delivery. In gold is the von Willebrand factor and factor eight levels of unaffected controls. In blue are women who, at the time of delivery, had von Willebrand factor levels greater than 50%. And in red, you see women who had von Willebrand factor levels less than 50%. And therefore, based on this study, were uh, qualified for treatment. And you can see that despite the fact that they were treated, for the most part, their factor levels were below uh, 
either the unaffected controls or the untreated women with von Willebrand disease at every time point, uh, implying that we may not, of women who have levels less than 50% and do require treatment at the time of delivery, they may need more or longer treatment than we give them. Next slide. This is the modified pictorial blood assessment chart scores uh, that, in other words, scores based on the amount of pad saturation after delivery in women uh, with and without von Willebrand disease. And in blue are the women without von Willebrand disease. Uh, along the x-axis, you see the weeks postpartum. Uh, in green, you have the women who had levels of at least 50% going into delivery. And you can see that they uh, are, they have pad counts almost identical to the women without von Willebrand disease, suggesting that if women go into delivery with a level of at least 50%, they're going to uh, have a similar clinical course to women without von Willebrand disease. And then if you look at the pad counts in red, these are women who had levels less than 50%. Their estimated blood loss at delivery was 40% higher. Their nadir hematocrits were 20% lower. And you can see that after three weeks postpartum, when the women without von Willebrand disease or those who had a von Willebrand disease with a higher level, their blood loss was tapering off significantly. These women continued to have significant pad counts. Next slide. So, uh, as we anticipate bleeding, potential bleeding in uh, the fetus or neonate, it's uh, important to understand von Willebrand disease inheritance. And it's always, it's almost always autosomal dominant. In other words, uh, just uh, from one gene and the uh, type one, uh, which is usually mild, uh, affects about 75% of the population type two, uh, which may be mild or moderate, uh, affects about 25% of the population. And type three, severe, affects less than 1% of the population. But this is a condition that requires uh, two genes, uh, one from each parent, either autosomal recessive or uh, codominant. And the implications for delivery is that a fetus or neonate of a woman with von Willebrand disease is unlikely to be severely affected unless both parents have a bleeding disorder or both parents have von Willebrand disease. And that has implications for delivery. Next slide. I want to switch to hemophilia and hemophilia carriers. Uh, I think everyone on this call probably knows that hemophilia is an X-linked uh, disease uh, that uh, the abnormal gene for uh, hemophilia is either on uh, is on the is on the X chromosome. Uh, a man has one X chromosome, and if he has an abnormal gene, he has hemophilia. A woman has two X chromosomes, so uh, she has one normal X chromosome, which may uh, protect her from the manifestations of hemophilia. Uh, next slide. For every 100 males with hemophilia, there are 156 carriers. You know, who is definitely a carrier? Uh, the mother of a son with hemophilia, if there's another affected male relative, or a woman who has more than one son with hemophilia. A woman who has one son with hemophilia, no other family affected family members is a possible carrier. A sister of a male with hemophilia is a possible carrier. The daughter of a man with hemophilia has inherited his abnormal X chromosome and is an obligate carrier. Uh, the daughter of a female carrier may or may not have inherited the affected X chromosome and is a possible carrier. Another relation of a male with hemophilia is a possible carrier. Next slide. 
So there, in terms of preventing maternal hemorrhage, there are important points that apply to any bleeding disorder. Almost all bleeding at the time of delivery is due to an obstetrical or surgical problem and not a pre-existing coagulation disorder. This is an important principle. And almost all massive hemorrhage starts with obstetrical or surgical bleeding and results in a coagulation problem. And obstetrical and surgical bleeding should be managed aggressively by the uh, obstetrical and anesthesia staff. IV tranexamic acid can be used safely immediately after delivery. An oral tranexamic acid can be used uh, starting in the postpartum period. Nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory drugs that may impair platelet function should be avoided. Next slide. So in terms of managing women who have either von Willebrand or hemophilia at the time of delivery, as we discussed, factor levels less than 50% as delivery is approaching, i.e. after 36 weeks of gestation, are a risk factor for bleeding at delivery. There are no randomized clinical trials to guide treatment. Recommendations are based on observational studies and expert opinion. Treatment is recommended for women with factor levels less than 50%. You saw that those are the women who are more likely to have bleeding, in fact, even if they do get treatment. If factor levels are less than 50%, the hematologist should be involved. And plasma-derived or recombinant products are recommended over cryoprecipitate or plasma when they are available. And regional anesthesia is considered safe, i.e. epidural is considered safe if levels are equal to or greater than 50%. Next slide. So management of postpartum hemorrhage, if it is to occur, depends on the cause. I want to emphasize that uh, most postpartum hemorrhage is either obstetrical or to a lesser portion uh, surgical and rarely due to some underlying uh, coagulation disorder. Uh, and when I say obstetrical, I mean any abnormal bleeding originating from the vessels within the gravid or postpartum uterus, particularly at the site of the placenta or where the placenta was, or surgical uh, bleeding due to incisions, lacerations, ruptured blood vessels, or a ruptured organ, including the bleeding from birth trauma or from incisions with cesarean delivery. And I use the term systemic bleeding uh, to refer to bleeding due to inadequate hemostasis. Next slide. So if we look at all postpartum hemorrhage, and it affects about 3% of deliveries, almost all you can see is obstetrical. Almost all the rest is surgical, and just a tiny sliver, less than 1%, is due to systemic causes. Next slide. And how is uh, severe postpartum hemorrhage managed? Well, obstetrical, due to obstetrical reasons, the uterus should be emptied, uh, the uterus should be stimulated to contract with uh, what we call uterotonics, the medications that stimulate the uterus to contract, the principal one being oxytocin. The uterus can be tamponaded at the placental site. The uterus can be devascularized, i.e. the abdomen can be opened and the uteris, the artery supplying the uterus can be ligated. And if all else fails, we can take the uterus out. Uh, surgical bleeding can be treated with sutures, with cautery, and uh, Sometimes, if time allows, embolization through interventional radiology. And then the systemic bleeding that really pertains to the things we are talking about can be treated with blood products, clotting factors, and tranexamic acid. Next slide. If a possibly affected but not severely affected baby is in anticipated, which is possible with any bleeding disorder, uh, that's inherited. The fetal scalp electrodes should be avoided. Operative vaginal delivery should be avoided. And circumcision should be postponed until a, the baby's been evaluated after delivery. Next slide. And when I say fetal scalp electrodes, I mean the little, the little teeny wire that is attached to the fetal scalp to continuously monitor the fetal heartbeat. Next slide. When I refer to operative vaginal delivery, I refer either to vacuum extraction or forceps. 
Next slide. Now, the risk of intracranial hemorrhage depends on the mode of delivery. Uh, in the systematic review by Davies and Kadir, uh, they found uh, a, a ninefold increased risk uh, of intracranial hemorrhage in affected male infants who were delivered vaginally. Most of the data for this systematic review actually came from the CDC. Vaginal delivery, uh, the rate of intracranial hemorrhage among affected male infants delivered vaginally was 3%, whereas uh, those delivered by cesarean was 0.4%. And this isn't even necessarily cesareans that were performed before the uh, labor started. Next slide. So uh, this is a slide uh, uh, from a European consortium uh, where uh, they found uh, that planned vaginal delivery resulted in a 2.5% chance of intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, assisted vaginal delivery, what we would call operative vaginal delivery, resulted in a 10.3% rate of intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, the uh, cesarean after labor was higher than the cesarean before labor. But what was, in, and one of the conclusions was avoid operative vaginal delivery, which is easier said than done because the baby does get to a point of no return in the pelvis. And what was also impressive about this study was that 4% of the deliveries of obligate or possible carriers were performed by uh, operative vaginal delivery. And, and uh, suggesting that even in the scenario where they knew they shouldn't apply forceps or use a vacuum, uh, they did, presumably because the baby got to the point of no return in the pelvis and couldn't be delivered by cesarean. Next slide. And the, which illustrates that the baby uh, gets to a certain point in the pelvis and if the baby has to be delivered immediately because of fetal distress, uh, the only way to get the baby out is to bring it out through the vagina rather than push it up through into the abdomen and bring it out through the uh, by cesarean. So the point I'm making is that the only way to avoid an operative vaginal delivery is to plan for a cesarean delivery before labor. Next point. So what is the fetus at risk? Uh, how can we identify the fetus at risk? Specific genetic testing is available to women who've been genotyped. They can, the pre-implantation genetic testing is available for embryos in women who have undergone in vitro fertilization. Prenatal genetic testing can be done by chorionic villus sampling, i.e. placental biopsy in the first trimester or amniocentesis in the second or third trimester. More prenatal genetic testing can be delayed until delivery is approaching for delivery planning. But any baby uh, should have the sex of the fetus determined either by cell-free fetal DNA or chorionic villus sampling or amniocentesis or ultrasound imaging. Next slide. So when a severely affected male infant is anticipated, confirmed, or possible, I recommend cesarean delivery. Next slide. Uh, if the and just a summary of delivery planning. If the mother is, if the mother and baby are mildly affected, the baby can have routine care and deliver in the local hospital. But if either is moderately or severely affected, uh, the baby, the mother should deliver in a hemostasis center with uh, pediatric hematology uh, available for the baby and adult hematology available for the mother. Next slide. So in summary, my key points were uh, obtaining factor levels during pregnancy in 36 weeks to plan for delivery. Uh, if factor levels are less than 50%, plan delivery at a center with hemostasis expertise and uh, have a plan in place for factor replacement. And with respect to the baby, provide preconception counseling so that the mother knows what her options are including pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, deliver potentially affected hemophilia males by cesarean to delivery where there is a newborn intensive care unit and hemostasis expertise, and avoid invasive procedures in any fetus potentially affected with a bleeding disorder. So um, I wanna thank 
you, uh, thank my colleagues at Duke, and uh, give a shout out to the Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders. Thank you. So we will transition over to Dr. Kuidis. So Marcy, what is the hard stop you would like me at? It's right now 427. Um, let's see if you can try to hit the 45 to 47, Does that give you enough? <laughs> yeah, that's fine, 45, 47, okay, I can do, okay, perfect. So I will, should be done before that. Okay, perfect. so let me just share my screen. So you should now have hopefully one slide. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. I want to thank uh, NHF, Marcy, Morgan, uh, Johnson, Neil Frick, and Angelina Wang for putting this on. Uh, it's always fun to do this with my dear uh, colleague and collaborator for over 20 years. Feeling ancient here, Andy, saying this, but we go back and. Um, I do, I will uh, later on my presentation uh, in honor of the fact that um, this is a symposium uh, about women with bleeding disorders. I do want to also uh, shout out a uh, colleague who uh, developed in part uh, transamic acid. They'll be towards the end of my presentation when we talk about treatment, but it's more appropriate to first uh, giving a shout out to uh, Dr. James. Uh, her history actually goes back uh, to uh, where I'm uh, centered in Rochester, New York. She was a uh, midwife and to her great credit, she uh, worked up the ranks and uh, ultimately uh, became a re world renowned uh, obstetrician uh, in maternal uh, fetal medicine. Uh, so I don't know how much the audience knows of her Rochester roots, but uh, we bonded over that and uh, it's just been wonderful over the years to uh, uh, collaborate with her. Uh, I have some of the obligatory uh, disclosures. These are the most important ones. <laughs> and I do love camp, uh, but all kidding aside, um, I was heavily conflicted, but transparent uh, before 2018. Moving forward, I've been uh, less conflicted uh, in general. I'm maybe psychologically it's still the case, but I'm talking about uh, actual uh, financial uh, conflicts because since that time, I served on the um, American Society of Hematology, ICH, NHF, uh, WFH uh, guide, uh, Guideline Committee for Management of Von Willebrands. And it was a wonderful, strict process. And if it was liberating for me, because I could now tell all these uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, who are asking uh, to be involved in this or that initiative that I could not be involved. Uh, it had to be arm's length because of this uh, commitment I made to be on the committee where we were being uh, vet, vetted and uh, could not really have any financial um, uh, relationships even with research, so that could be disclosed, but uh, it was just uh, very liberating uh, in that uh, sense. Uh, our roadmap today is to talk about uh, some of these uh, points here uh, that are of hematological concern. Uh, Dr. James did a great job reviewing the obstetrical uh, uh, aspects, and I'm just going to now follow up about some of the fine points of hematological evaluation. Some of it's going to be general uh, to bring everybody up to speed, and hopefully there's a few trainees uh, because it's a little bit uh, directed at them at the beginning. But in general, as a starting point, um, as a hematologist, we obviously are uh, often quite involved and in, we involved in the care of these patients, we should be involved in the care of these patients, uh, whether it's before they're pregnant uh, and uh, taking care of them if they have a known diagnosis, and there's several uh, diagnoses categories, of course, or certainly uh, seeing them if uh, they're referred uh, perhaps in adolescence with heavy menstrual bleeding, or perhaps at the time of tonsillectomy when there's a family history, or perhaps, unfortunately, if they have excessive bleeding post-tonsillectomy. Uh, 
and then certainly uh, on occasion we'll see them for the first time because they're bleeding uh, while pregnant antepartum uh, uh, in some of those circumstances. We do know as an aside that the hormonal state of pregnancy, which becomes exacerbated, leads to vasodilatation, expands the facial flush, the warmth, and that in itself can induce epistaxis without even having a bleeding disorder. And often at that point, it's known as von Willebrand's, their levels are going to be palliated by the second or third trimester by and large, and uh, they may just have, um, you know, uh, epistaxis from uh, the hormonal effect of vasodilatation. So don't immediately jump to conclusions that, oh, this is from the von Willebrand's. As Andy stated, uh, you know, more often than not, it's going to be a surgical or obstetrical cause, especially postpartum. Obviously, we get involved. Um, and again, to uh, reiterate uh, Andy's very nice presentation, uh, the main causes are one through three. The main causes are one through three. The main causes are one through three. It's really not number four, because by the time they're bleeding in the postpartum setting, their uh, underlying um, perhaps inherited hemostatic disorder has probably been corrected either by us or because of the gestational uh, palliation of these conditions, as the, the British are fond to use that term, uh, or it's because they now develop a coagulopathy from the postpartum hemorrhage. So again, uh, I couldn't help myself last uh, summer when I was attending this wonderful presentation, a plenary uh, presentation by Anne Gaudier, a OBGYN uh, in Paris, France. And she made the point that uh, the thrombin or lack of thrombin coagulopathy is quite uncommon. And yet I'm fighting every day my very fine fellows and residents who are immediately thinking about uh, von Willebrand's when they're bleeding out uh, with postpartum hemorrhage. And chances are, uh, unless it's a type 3 that's not been adequately replaced, or unless it's a Glanzmann's or Bernard Soulier, which is very difficult to manage, um, you know, it's unlikely that number 4 is the main cause of uh, bleeding. But be that as it may, certainly in the uh, prepartum or antepartum uh, setting, uh, we still want to do our due diligence and evaluate them for an underlying uh, disorder of hemostasis. And that begins also with a reminder that, you know, guys, we got to be good internists. Remember, the blood goes through all your organs. Just don't focus on the lab testing. Uh, remember that there's uh, disorders of internal medicine that is associated with bleeding. This is from my dear colleagues, uh, Russ, uh, Ross Baker and James O'Donnell, who actually early this morning, my time, but at 10 o'clock their time, his time, Ross's time in Australia, we uh, were, we had a, um, a conference call uh, coming up with guidance uh, for ISTH regarding uh, bleeding disorders of undetermined uh, cause, what we are now calling BDUC. But before you jump to BDUC, remember about these other causes. This included a lady that I just saw last week with my mid-level referred for easy bruising. Uh, it was quite obvious when you walked in the room that um, you know she was quite emaciated and she had an undetectable vitamin uh, C level. So occasionally we'll see scurvy. We're all uh, very interested to check a factor 10 level when we suspect amyloidosis. And you know there is still a high prevalence of hepatitis C and liver disease. And as you know, that's being supplanted by, um, uh, by obesity, steatohepatitis. So that's a cause. Uh, so again, a very good, um, you know, hematologist needs to be good internist, think about all these causes, both on the left and the right. Occasionally, I have diagnosed Cushing syndrome because of uh, uh, perperic uh, lesions uh, referred to me. And hypothyroidism, you'd hate to miss because that can cause acquired von Willebrand's, and uh, that can also be associated with heavy menstrual bleeding. And, uh, you know, you learn from your cases. I have too many gray hairs from all my cases I've learned from, including a case about 25 years ago when I was a hotshot young hematologist thinking that I was going to diagnose von Willebrand's and all these, uh, you know, uh, women with heavy menstrual bleeding. And that's why I told the patient her levels were low and uh, she did not respond to DDAVP and other treatments. And ultimately, before the uh, OBGYN was going to do a hysterectomy, he called me and berated me, said, couldn't you tell her voice was very hoarse? She has uh, hypothyroidism, you dummy. And sure enough, with correction, her levels, uh, you know, corrected. So please, you know, take those blinders off. 
And again, just to bring everybody up to speed, uh, if we have any trainees on the call, remember, there's only really five types of leading if we keep it simple here. I'd rather not have you memorize. I'd rather have you understand the physiology, the lead your pathology. But really, these are the five types of bleeding uh, that we're going to be talking about. And so that's outlined here. Usually, congenital thrombocytopenia, unless it's something severe like Wiscott Aldrich, is not going to really cause severe bleeding. There's a few kindreds we take care of. We have mutations like in RUNX or NKD. Uh, remember, there's over 40 genetic disorders, uh, places like Versity in Wisconsin can test for. But usually, the bleeding is not going to be quite uh, severe. Uh, to cause significant bleeding, but some of these kindreds can have playlists in the 30 to 40,000 range. And uh, certainly more commonly would be uh, platelet dysfunction. Uh, these kind of non-specific platelet aggregation release studies that are probably consistent with storage pool or secretion defect. Less common would be the severe disorders, which all of us know memorably uh, who those patients are at our center because they will have lifelong bleeding and uh, peripartum bleeding can be very challenging and very scary, particularly since they bec can become aluminized platelet transfusions. And obviously, we're all going to, you know, come across von Willebrands in our, you know, training and in our practice, uh, you know, in that, uh, you know, in that uh, regard. Um, and again, the majority are going to have a mild reduction under 50%, as Andy mentioned. And it's the ones with the type 2 as well as severes that, you know, can certainly uh, present quite a problem peripartum in managing in that sense. And most hemophilia centers will have a, few, a handful of patients with factor 2, 5, 7, uh, 9, 11, uh, 13 deficiency in that regard. Uh, though, again, not very common. Factor 13 is about 1 per 3 million. I last diagnosed it when I was a fellow, and the joke is that once I diagnose another case, I'm retiring. So it's interesting, uh, you know, uh, my nurses always joke about that, that, uh, you know, we may have a case that may cause you to retire. And the fibrinolytic disorders, we don't talk about them much because we don't fully understand how to diagnose them, and they're not, these are not very common unless you're in a place like Indiana in that, lit, in that sense. But in putting this all together, again, this is to bring the trainees up to speed here, and I'm happy to share the slide deck if you email me. Um, but remember, we are fond of trying to now semi-objectify this in terms of the ICH bleeding assessment tool. So these are the questions we ask. We're not going to ask, you know, are you a bleeder? We want to ask specifically some of these questions. And then obviously, these are the core tests that Andy was part of the NHLBI, NHLBI guidelines uh, back in 2008 that came up with these core tests. These can be done, uh, you know, the top ones can be done as an inpatient. And then if those uh, first four are normal, you want to do VWF testing. Nowadays, ideally, it should be the glycoprotein 1B M assay. And then obviously, platelet aggregation, as we tell our very um, anxious house staff, you can't order it as an inpatient. It needs to be done as an outpatient to make sure the patient's fasting, to find a, a suitable uh, control in the lab uh, in that regard. So again, we want to, when we see these people, whether it's antepartum or prepartum, referred for bleeding history before, you know, they deliver, uh, we would like you to do the bleeding score. It's a type of common language we use. And then obviously we talked about not missing hypothyroidism. Don't make the mistake I made. Think about over-the-counter meds. There's a lot of them. It's just not aspirin, my friends. There's a pretty long list here. And then finally, remember the nuances of checking your VWF levels. Remember, there's, level, there's variables that drive it up. And that includes, as uh, Andy mentioned, and I'll show you also an example of uh, pregnancy, of course. Uh, but usually, that's not within the first trimester. That would be a little bit premature. Um, uh, if it is uh, normal in the first trimester, there's a good explanation. I'll explain that, uh, usually. And uh, just remember, you know, traumatic blood draws, and that's not necessarily in a child, but also an adult uh, sometimes can find that uh, uh, very traumatic where their heart rate goes up into the 140s. And guess what? That's associated with epinephrine, which guess what? Releases VWF. And we've learned uh, for better or for worse with uh, the pandemic that um, I think my personal record, I had a case of 560% VWF level um, in a, a COVID patient. We see that now uh, less commonly given the vaccinated cohort, they have less of an exuberant uh, hyperquiopathic response. Uh, 
And uh, there's an essay done by a colleague, Ritten Kumar, uh, and uh, Bryce Curlin uh, at Ohio State, Ritten's now in, uh, in the Harvard system, but he showed that uh, just putting uh, people on an exercise bike, including Dr. Curlin, uh, will raise levels. It was a neat study. The investigators were control groups. Uh, and also advancing, advancing age can do it. We and others have clearly shown, I think it's well accepted now that aging can raise levels and lead to normalization. Uh, VWF uh, of type 1 VWD uh, over 5 to 20 years later. Uh, so if someone is referred to you in the uh, antepartum setting that they carry this history of von Willebrand's and you repeat the levels in the first trimester and they're normal, maybe they've outgrown the diagnosis or maybe they didn't have von Willebrand's in the first place. Maybe it was a laboratory artifact back then because um, there are levels that, there are variables that drive the levels down. We know, of course, uh, to our dear uh, since the part of colleague Joan Gill that uh, group O is associated with lower levels. I already mentioned how this is the third time hypothyroidism. And then certainly, you know, there's so many pre-analytical variables. We did a nice multi-center study with Julie Jaffrey where we uh, showed that on retesting at a hemophilia treatment center where we can immediately draw the blood and process it and spin off the platelets so they don't uh, pick up your VWF, uh, the levels often, uh, you know, are uh, increased, um, you know, in a third to half. So that's why my lab, I have a nice sign that says repeat until normal. Then there's also, you know, issues regarding new testing. These are also, uh, you can learn more about this through the uh, diagnostic panel guideline that if you just Google Paula James and Blood Advances 2020, you get a, a free PDF of this. And uh, as you know, uh, VWF uh, is a binding protein, and uh, it's, you know, one of its major binding partners is glyproprotein 1B. So we want to measure the activity through a platen-dependent uh, uh, assay. And uh, there's no better assays better than the McFarlane uh, aggregami using lyophilized like, platelets using uh, either a glyproprotein uh, 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 recombinant on a matrix with racinin or using uh, a hypermutated form, that's not FDA approved. So many places like in New York say we don't have the GP1BM available, but GP1BR is an improvement over the classic uh, racine activity we used to do using lyophilized platelets. We've removed that variable. Now let's try to get rid of the racetin, and that's the advantage of the hypermutated GP1BM assay not readily available everywhere. Um, so we're anxiously waiting, at least in New York State, for FDA approval so we can get it covered. Remember, we have liberalized the diagnosis using a cutoff of 50%. I don't fully agree with a lower ratio of 0.5. Um, I've kind of compromised 0.6. And, um, you know, ideally, if, if you can, you should also send uh, a sample for collagen binding. Most assays don't do this, but Milwaukee does that. And it's very helpful to help sort it out with uh, type 2. And um, also, uh, even though we still do the low-dose racine-induced uh, glutination, uh, um, the guidelines do suggest uh, doing the genetic testing. But again, that does require, you know, insurance approval and the like. What about the patient where you've come up empty in your uh, testing? And uh, so that would be, you know, the bleeding score in that regard. I just realized that I'm way over uh, my limit here. Uh, so I'm not going to be able to talk much about uh, bleeding disorder of undetermined frequency, but think about that and how to manage it, typically with transamic acid or DDAVP. Um, unfortunately, um, I'm not going to have much time to talk about uh, epidural. I'm going to ask for a few more minutes to go over time just to highlight this. And if there are questions, uh, please send me an um, email, and I'm happy to share this slide deck with you. Uh, the new we do feel 50% is adequate, except for type 2B or type 3. Uh, it may not be adequate, and so, uh, but we did uh, decide in the guidelines of using a cutoff of 50%. Uh, fortunately, Andy covered most of this about uh, uh, you know treatment. So again, I'm not going to talk much about this other than this that you know we like to sample samples as Andy said at least twice. Please do that in the pregnancy. Uh, Dr. Joe Johnson prefers you could at least do it uh, around 20 and 28 weeks also to have data around times complications occur. So if you're in Seattle, they'll do it at least four times. We try to get it le levels at least two to three times. 
And remember, um, you know, the community is not getting levels enough. In a beautiful study by Sarah O'Brien, uh, looking at database, only a third of our practitioners sampled levels. And those who did not have sampled levels had higher PPH. What about DDAVP? Andy and I are not big proponents of using it, even if you're a known responder. For these reasons, one through three, in the interest of time, just so you could quickly look at these bullet points, there are problems with DDAVP. We are moving away from it. In select cases, though, it can be used, but make sure you're going to watch your fluid restriction. Easier said than done, my friends. And uh, only, uh, you know, give it to somebody who has, you know, a known uh, response in uh, that regard. Um, and again, remember, the problem is, is that even though the levels go up, they don't stay in that nice area. We want to ideally see them like a normal pregnancy between 150 to 250. So that's why we're seeing bleeding in these people. That's why these five examples here, these studies uh, show that we're seeing uh, postpartum hemorrhage, as Andy mentioned. We probably need to aim for a higher target. And remember, we need to treat for three to seven days. Uh, for uh, non uh, 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 vaginal and uh, longer for C section. Joel Johnson, Barb Conkle, and I are doing a study that's trying to aim for a higher target over 100%. So stay tuned. And uh, again, it's a shame if I just don't mention about fibrinolysis and the fact that we should honor this wonderful uh, female physician and researcher, uh, Dr. Utako Akimoto. Uh, she was a pioneer. She helped pioneer the use of transamic acid while she was raising a family. So I'm going to stop there. I don't have really time to talk about transamic acid. Uh, other than that, um, you know, again, the guidelines uh, state we should use it postpartum uh, for VW uh, patients, but uh, we did a study with Michelle Lavin, and the use is not very commonly used. Uh, again, I'm happy to uh, share this slide deck with you. Um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, about other patients who have inherited bleeding disorders, uh, the ones we worry about the most are these two. And uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to have to stop there. Again, I'm very sorry. I uh, went too slow on the diagnosis part. Um, and uh, again, a lot of this work would not be possible without these wonderful collaborators, including Dr. James, who's in some of these pictures here as well as other colleagues. So I will stop there. Thank you. And again, I'm sorry I had to go fast. If you do uh, would like the slide deck, please uh, email NHF and if uh, unless you have my um, email and I can send you the slide deck. Thank you. Dr. Kuides and Dr. James. All right, welcome back um, everyone. Thank you for participating in those conversations. I know we it was short in time, so hopefully you were able to get to what you'd like to. So let's talk with Dr. James in your room. What was some of the discussion that you was shared? You're on mute, by the way, sorry. We went, th we went through the questions. I, uh, I think we didn't get to the grand finale, which for my audience, I'll make sure they know this uh, patient, this this little boy wound up getting a circumcision. Uh, he did not bleed from the circumcision, uh, but within days after delivery, he uh, had neurologic changes, uh, was taken to the emergency room and found to have an intracranial hemorrhage with and severe factor eight deficiency. And we, but we went through all the places where there could have been, we could have done something different uh, along the way. Uh, we talked about um, uh, how uh, the missed opportunity to identify this patient as a carrier. Our, we knew she was a carrier. We talked about uh, uh, the fact that her, in terms of what might predict her bleeding, uh, her personal history was probably the most predictive. We uh, talked about uh, offering, uh, identifying that this was a male fetus at least, and then offering her uh, cesarean delivery. Standing, thank you. Um, Dr. Quides, how about your room? Do you have anything else to add to what Dr. James shared from her room? Uh, no, quite similar. I, there was some interesting uh, feedback that um, some centers like our own uh, still offer vaginal delivery to a known affected carrier. But again, we review the studies, Dr. James, uh, 
um, you know, mentioned. And, um, you know, be that as may, there are some families given, you know, past history who, um, you know, perhaps have had vaginal delivery without difficulty. And as long as, you know, the team is aware to avoid electrodes and forceps, that still is a potential option. But I think based on, you know, the systematic review of literature, the important work Dr. Kulkarni has done at the, um, you know, CDC when she was there, and uh, also uh, the the review by uh, our colleague Razan Kadir, uh, we do uh, advise a, you know, cesarean, but, um, you know, there are some patients who would still or want to have a vaginal. Yeah. 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 We're just not going to accept that. Okay. And can I can I just ask a question, Peter? Are, you're not just talking about for von Willebrand's disease. You're, are, are, or is that the situation you're talking about? Are you talking about carriers as well? Just oh, I'm sorry. This would be for hemophilia carriers, okay. and perhaps a you know a type three, um, right. if you know there is a concern. But no, not not for VWD. No, not for standard VWD. Or other conditions. Um, though you could argue with Glansman's or Bernard Slier, you would be worried, but you know, those are typically um, you know, uh yeah, that I mean that could be applicable there too. So great. Thanks. I, we're having some of the same trouble here in our center that it's not necessarily widely accepted. Well, I would like to thank you both. Um, we are tight on time. So if any of the participants have any questions, please send those in to myself, Neil, or Angelina on our team, and we will refer them over to Dr. Kuides and Dr. James for answers. Also, please watch your email for an evaluation from the Uni University of Nebraska Medical Center, because that is how you're going to access your CME units. Um, and then there will be resource documents and the recorded portion of this um, session will come up on the NHF website um, to follow. We're, we don't have exact timing yet, but these will be shared online. If you have colleagues who you feel like would benefit from hearing this program who weren't able to join today, please note that we will be sharing that out soon. So thank you to everyone for who attended and thank you so much, Dr. James and Dr. Kuides for sharing your expertise with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.